Hello. I want to talk a bit about, a bit about my own poem today. One of my own poems uh, called And Did Those Feet in Ancient Times. It was written about 15 years ago, a time when I was part of a writing group and there was pressure on me to kind of write something every week. I didn't really have a lot to say, so usually I just wait until I've got something to say and maybe two years can pass by bef between poems. If I don't have anything to say, I just don't write. But on this occasion, yeah, I was writing... There was pressure on me to write regularly, and of course I didn't really have anything to write about, so I had to create something, and uh, many of these poems were kind of written with the form. The structure was, not the structure, but the, 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 the way it was, the way it, the way it, the poem comes across in terms of the format was more important than the content. I often tried to keep keep things moving very fast, use a lot of rhymes, a lot of smart references, irony, satire, like this, to hide the fact that I didn't really have a lot, a lot to say. So many poets do that a lot of the time. Many writers do in all, in all formats, stories and novels too, and plays. So, uh, yeah, the basic theme of, of it then, of this particular poem, is intellectual rather than highly emotional or personal. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, so I would say the, the basic theme of the poem is how people, in a contrary way, often prefer to believe what is almost certainly untrue than what is the truth. People love conspiracy theories and <coughs> lots of books and films are made about conspiracy theories and uh, whatever is almost certainly accepted by the majority. You will always find an outlier who, who tells you it's all wrong and there's a cover-up and uh, actually the truth is completely different than what everybody everybody thinks. So it's true that occasionally facts may emerge that prove that an original viewpoint was wrong. But most of the time, if something has been established by facts, especially over a long period, then it's true. And for some reason, you always get the people who who prefer to believe conspiracy theories and and uh, be contrary, believe the opposite of what everybody else believes. <coughs> so that's really what the what the poem was about. As I say, it's a it's an intellectual position, not really not really highly emotional. So perhaps I should begin by reading the poem. And did those feet in ancient times, and did those feet in ancient times walk upon Kashmir's rolling hills, and did some Brahmin from the jungle climbs instruct him in the Vedic skills, and did Neil Armstrong really tread upon the rocky lunar face, and were those famous words famously read upon the moon or in some other place? Within some secret basement room were pictures cunningly contrived to seem as if men walked upon the moon, who jumped and hopped and leapt and dived. Who was the author of Macbeth? Did Francis Bacon bear the pen? Or was it through Kit Marlowe's life and death that Will became the pseudonym? Who said the earth was really round? How can we know it isn't flat? Have Darwin's cogitations really found that man's a mammal, like a rat? Did Einstein truly conquer time and space through relativity? Or was such hubris deemed a fatal crime against our primitive ennui? 
as I say, I was trying to write a poem with a certain amount of surface brilliance here, a lot of rhymes, a lot of irony, a lot of satire, a lot of references, um, but the basic theme was so many people would rather believe conspiracy theories and extreme outlying ideas rather than what is almost certainly true probably 99% sure so the title which was a bit lazy I just took the first word of the poem the title uh, refers both to Jesus, the idea that Jesus was in England did those feet in ancient times walk upon England's pastures green I don't know if that was originally some kind of metaphor. Maybe the writer didn't actually mean that Jesus came to England. But uh, certainly there is an Indian tradition that, that Jesus left the Middle East and went to India and studied Hinduism, the, Ve the, Veda, the Vedas, uh, the Vedic scripts, with Brahmin priests in Kashmir. So this is, this is a well-known story in India and you, you hear it repeated quite frequently it's almost certainly untrue of course you know he was 32 guy the guy who was 32 year, years old or when he died and uh, you know he, he he had a family in the Middle East it's there's no but there's no reason to believe he went to India and Kashmir and learnt about the and learnt about uh, the Vedic scripts but some people believe it and then refer to another similar kind of situation where lots of people don't believe that the Americans really went to the moon I can see it might seem quite difficult to believe for some people today when there hasn't really been much of a space program for a long time and people have to believe that a man was landed on the moon in 1969 a long time ago when before the development of microcomputers and so and so on and so forth um, however I, it's, I, I can remember being a boy of 10 and watching it with my, my mother watching the grainy black and white f pictures coming back from the moon and uh, you would have to believe that the Americans somehow or for some reason actually constructed a, a kind of Hollywood um, studio version of the moon and pretended there was no gravity there and just beamed it around the world. So why would they do that or maybe... We can think of reasons why they would, but who would believe it? You know, how, how would they get away with it? And why, why, why would they do it? Anybody who was alive at that time knows that there was a, there was a long sequence of missions to the moon and space missions which, which went from orbiting the Earth or just going into space to begin with and coming back and then orbiting the Earth and eventually going out to the moon and orbiting the moon and finally landing on the moon so it wasn't like it just it just happened overnight it was a whole it was a whole program of space missions which finally concluded with landing not not just one group of men on the moon but several and then finally the interest waned and the money was redirected to other places and and uh, it was never revisited and people who are alive today find it difficult to believe oh so long ago like 50 years ago we had men on the moon it's uh, i can't believe it before computers but yeah remember this was in the aftermath of the second world war uh, there had been a big surge of uh, the big surge and improvement in technology often unfortunately unfortunate unfortunately in the area of weapons so the atomic bomb had been developed and 
the Americans actually got lots of the German scientists who had been working for Hitler, Hitler to work on the, the Moon Project, especially, especially von Braun, who had been the Hitler's rocket scientist and responsible for the V1 and V2 weapons in the war. And, uh, yeah, so it's anyone who wants to follow the story of the Americans putting a man on the moon will also be following the story of the space race between, between America and Russia, and both sides were, were putting men in the moon, putting men in, into space and uh, developing the, the space programs. And the Russians had the first man in space, didn't they? The Yuri Gagarin. And uh, anyone, anyway, anyone who wants to believe it didn't happen, you can always create a story if you want to, a narrative which other people who like to not believe the official version and and would rather accept some kind of outlying theory. Uh, you can always create a story which people like that will believe. So, yeah, if you, it's much more reasonable to look at the whole history of the period and look at the evidence that's there. Uh, and if you do that, you'll come to the conclusion that 99.99% sure is the fact that, that the Americans put a man on the moon, but yet some people doubt it, including lots of, lots of Americans. Uh, so I go on with an, another reference to something that uh, people, in my opinion, believe unreasonably, which is that someone else wrote the plays of Shakespeare. So... Who was the author of Macbeth? Did Francis Bacon bear the pen? Lots of people don't want to believe that someone who didn't go to university and uh, you know, wasn't high up in the Elizabethan court could have written these great plays, which actually were written for uh, the public theatre anyway. And, of course, they, they say that Bacon really wrote Shakespeare's plays without there being any real evidence for it. I mean, you know, Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare's plays. There are plenty of people around who knew Shakespeare. He was an actor. He was part owner of the Globe. Uh, yeah, he, we know that he was producing plays for his acting, for his actors. We know that after his death, some of the people who knew him put out his plays uh, for people to read in a printed form. So if you don't want to believe all that, prefer to believe Francis Bacon wrote the plays, and fair enough. But, you know, you're, you're really ignoring the obvious. Other people say that Christopher Marlowe wrote the plays, say that his death at the age of 29 in a tavern never really happened, and it was just his way of disappearing, and somehow he faded into the backgrounds and became the writer of Shakespeare's plays. Um, again, it's, you know, almost certainly wrong, untrue, but if, you, you, you always have a few people who believe things like that and will write books about it and so on and so forth. Uh, how can we really know anything at all? Who said the earth was really round? How can we know it isn't flat? If you don't believe evidence, if you don't believe what people tell you, then... If you don't believe science, if you don't believe the evidence of your own, you know, you, your own ability to check facts against facts, um, to verify things, if you, if you don't believe what anyone tells you, and after being able to check it, then you can't really believe anything at all. You can just say everything is untrue and whatever you want to believe, you will accept. Um... Then I refer to a great British scientist, biologist. Have Darwin's cogitations really found that man's a mammal like a rat? So obviously lots of people don't really want to accept Darwin's findings, and yet 
the world of science accepted them a long time ago. It's only a few, a few groups who, for various personal reasons, don't find his conclusions suitable for them, who, 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 who do reject them. So, uh, yeah, the, the world accepted Darwin's ideas about natural selection a long time ago. And, uh, yeah, it was a great contribution to, to science and to our knowledge about ourselves and our place in the world. Uh, and then finally, the last stanza refers to probably the greatest modern scientist, Einstein. Did Einstein truly conquer time, space, through relativity? Or was such hubris deemed a fateful crime against our primitive ennui? So uh, most people don't know anything about Einstein and space and time. If you say E equals MC squared, then they won't understand anything about it. But it uh, doesn't mean that, that it's not true. So I think that anyone who wants to check what Einstein did can, can do it. And you don't have to be a great scientist or mathematician to work out that he made a big contribution to science by, uh, by coming to a certain understanding of space and time and making a model which made the universe more uh, under understandable, more uh, more efficacious for for us, and some people don't like it. They think that it's 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 man going beyond what he can or could or should do. It's it's hubris. It's it's like it's like when man went against the gods in the time of ancient Greece. You go too, too, too far, you go against, you get too proud, and the gods will make you take a fall. Well, I don't think it's like that. I think that he really came up with a great contribution, which has enabled us to understand ourselves and our place in the world, like as Darwin did, uh, made a contribution. And... Uh, these are things which other scientists in the future will build upon and great contributions and 99.9% .9 of people know that these are important contributions to science and accept them but as before there, is all, there are always people who for some reason will not believe and will write books and make films about another narrative which ignores all the most important points and emphasizes a few relatively unimportant things. Um, so, yeah, the origin of the point then was, was, was that, the, the fact that a lot of people just don't accept the obvious. And although... A conspiracy theory might be right now and then. 99% of the time, they're wrong. And, uh, yeah, if you don't believe the evidence which you can find yourself, find yourself, then really you'll be in a position where you, you don't trust anyone and you, and you don't believe anything. That's not a very, that's not very constructive So the theme of the poem was not was intellectual. It wasn't coming from my heart. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a highly emotional poem. As I said before, what I tried to do was to write a poem which was full of irony, full of satire, full of examples of what I was talking about, and uh, there's a certain element of. Of, of, of light humor running through it that people could just ha saying kind of how could people just ignore the obvious uh, and believe 
alternatively in a very contrary way when the facts were really in front of their nose um, but yeah I, I wanted to dress it up in all sorts of in all sorts of interesting language and each stanza to talk about the form each stanza has or quatrain has two rhymes so that is always uh, nice for the ear I think if it's if it's done well when each stanza has two rhymes instead of one rhyme and you, you get the music coming around more free more frequently uh, and if, it, if there's a sense of irony in the lines uh, there should be a kind of a sense of surface brilliance if if the words are chosen well um, yeah so it's should be ironic should be satirical should 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 have lots of interesting vocabulary um, and the actual quatrains are made up of iambic tetrameter that's eight syllables a line and the meter is mostly I iambic so uh, yeah that's basically this poem it's an attempt to be satirical really about those people who just don't believe anything even though the truth is in front of their noses so I hope that's interesting I haven't really got anything else to say about it thanks a lot